whether or not you've completed the homework assignments. Um, the way that happens, if you complete a homework assignment, you get 100 points. If you don't complete a homework assignment, you get zero points. Now with our last um, grading period, what I did for those of you that took the opportunity to do makeup homework, um, I allowed you to have half credit. So instead of getting the full 100, you got 50 out of 100 points, which actually did help boost some of the grades. So thank you for those of you that took advantage of that. That will help your overall grade. Um, and so each semester, we just need to make sure that we do our very best to submit homework. I'm not super strict on deadlines, um, but once we start the grading, um, the process of having to submit grades, it's helpful for me to know those that have already completed the work. So, um, and especially this week, I'm not gonna have a homework assignment, so you'll have an extra week um, available to you to be able to submit that homework assignment. And it's a fairly simple homework assignment. Um, it shouldn't take you but just, you know, five or 10 minutes to be able to answer that. And again, as a reminder, our homework is an opportunity for me as a teacher to make sure that you as a student are engaging in the class because this is an online class. And even when I'm able to be live with you, the interaction that we have together is somewhat limited as opposed to an in-person class. Therefore, this is a way for me to be able to see that you, the student, are engaging in the class and putting forth an effort to learn what is being taught. So that being said, I do appreciate those of you that have already completed the homework assignment. And um, just for your information and future reference, please, please, please make sure you're completing those homework assignments because it will affect your grade um, at some point. All right, so moving on. We are starting again, um, chapter eight, and this was um, actually a really interesting lesson to study. Um, we are gonna talk about the daily program of activities, or um, in other words, day-to-day -day life. What's a typical day like um, for those that live during this time and in this uh, particular culture, this area? So this is gonna give us maybe a, like a, a little glimpse of what an average day would look like um, for these people. So first of all, um, it talks about early rising. Now, I know um, for me personally, I am not much of an early riser. Um, I used to be more of an early riser when I was much younger, but now that I've had kids and my sleep pattern has been affected greatly by that, um, I tend to, I still get up, you know, earlier in the morning. I don't sleep, you know, till noon or anything, um, but I don't get up as early as I used to. So maybe the older I get, the later I sleep in. But the custom here was to get up early. Now, there were a few reasons for this, and one of those being um, the excessive heat. So in the land where they live, um, and you all are familiar with heat as well, living in a tropical climate. Um, by, you know, the middle of the day, it was unbearably hot. The sun was, you know, shining down on them. And any work, any labor that had to be completed, it was better for their health and um, for their safety, probably, to be able to complete that earlier in the daytime where the sun had not quite got as hot yet. So um, they had a habit of rising up early in the morning. And there are several um, references there. Um, let's just go through these quickly. Um, Abraham rose early in the morning, found in Genesis 22 and 3. Moses rose up early in the morning, Exodus 34 and 4. And Job rose up early in the morning, Job 1 and 5. Now, Luke has an interesting perspective on this. Um, Luke stated that those that wanted to hear Jesus speak, now this is, you know, fast forwarding um, out of the Old Testament, we're in the New Testament, and this is when Jesus is here on earth teaching in the temples, teaching in um, various places. It stated that they came early in the morning to the temple, found in Luke 21, 38. So if you want an opportunity to hear Jesus speak, um, you know, in a live audience, you had to make sure that you got up early. Um, now, the, another importance of waking up early is Mark 1 and 5 tells of a time when Jesus rose up a great while 
before day, uh, meaning before daybreak, like when the sun actually came up, he went out to a certain place and, or to a solitary place rather, and prayed. So it's important, um, a lot of teachers and preachers talk about the early rising and to be able to have a time of prayer and devotion. As soon as you wake up, the earlier you wake up and start your day with Jesus, the better. Um, I feel like there's a lot of validity to that. I feel like there's a lot of, you know, uh, benefit to starting your day out early, um, especially starting it out firstly with a time of devotion and prayer. Um, but again, like I said, the older I get with the different commitments, um, the different travel, like um, I'm actually recording this um, late in the evening here for me, it's about midnight. Um, and so I will have to stay up for a while to be able to upload it. So tomorrow I am probably not going to be much of an early riser because I'm going to be staying up all night, um, getting this ready to be able to send out to Mam Roxanne. Um, but, um, typically if I weren't doing this, um, you know, I would be getting up early and starting my day with my devotions and a time of prayer. So what are early risers greeted with? What, you know, if you live there at the Axe compound, I can testify, um, to this based on my, uh, recent stay there. We had two roosters that were, um, the construction crews. I'm assuming it was their alarm clock because every morning about 5 or 5.30 a.m., those roosters would let everybody know, hey, it's time to get up. Um, and we actually nicknamed them um, Adobo and Inesol. So anytime you're ever visiting the Axe campus, know that the roosters, if they're still there, I don't know, they may not be there anymore. Um, those roosters do have names and they like to wake everybody up <laughs> really early in the morning. So early risers were greeted, not necessarily by the sound of roosters crowing, but they were greeted by the sound of the grinding of grain. So the women would start early in the morning, very, very early. They would begin their day with grinding the grain. Now, if you'll remember, the grain was a key component in their making of bread, and bread was made fresh. Bread was a symbol of life. Um, if you didn't, I mean, it was just part of their day-to-day -day life. It was part of every meal they ate. It was a way to offer, like we studied um, last week, if you were hosting someone, you offered um, some type of food to them. Typically, it was going to be bread. So the grinding of the grain to make this bread started very early in the morning. And again, this was done by the ladies and could last all day long. So they may start early in the morning with this process, but they could be working all day and in, late into the evening just um, for them to be able to grind the amount of grain that was required for them that would be necessary for them to bake their bread. And the grinding of the grain was a sound of life and activity. I've noticed that in this study, this particular um, workbook or book that we're studying from, the significance of food, the significance of light, the significance of bread, there was a, a symbolism between that and life. So the things that make up our life, which may seem, you know, like inconsequential, they're no big deal, it's just, you know, a small little thing, it represents something much more powerful than, than that. It represents life. Same thing with this grinding of grain that they would hear every single morning. This is life, it shows activity, people are alive, God is good, we're alive, we have another day, another opportunity to serve him. Now, when Jeremiah spoke of the judgment of Israel, one of the things um, <clears throat> to be taken that he said that the Lord would take for them was the sound of the millstones. This was to show a uh, and a way to identify the fact that they have been left that there was no longer a need for the millstones or the the um, instrument that was used to grind the grain because there was no life they had no grain to to even grind there was no crops there was no production of the food there so if you don't have grain to grind it probably means that you don't have a very successful crop and that was you know in a time of judgment uh, now typically <clears throat> the servants worked in the grinding of the grains. Um, but if their home did not have servants, which is typically the case, especially with some of the um, 
tent dwelling um, communities and probably those that were used to the single dwelling or the single room homes, um, the women would do the job. Now it was considered beneath the men. This was not a job that the men would do um, usually ever. Um, they would not do the grinding of the grain. And part of this was also spoken about um, by the prophet Jeremiah on the judgment of Israel, and it was to take the young men uh, to grind. That's found in Lamentations uh, 5.13. So as a way for judgment, and also it would be humiliating experience for these young men to be used in this manner when it was an, a job or a chore that was reserved for the servants or the women. Um, and also um, there's a reference to, if you remember when Samson um, had judgment or punishment put on him when he was thrown in prison, he was forced to grind in the prison house. Um, that's found in Judges 16.21. You remember he was blinded and then he was tied to that meal and he was forced to grind the grain. So it was not only, you know, considered um, an embarrassment, but it could even be considered, you know, a punishment. All right, moving on, meal times. Now, to me, this seems like a section they could have easily included in any of the previous lessons we've had since we've talked about food a great great deal in so far in this um, study but the meal times now typically there were only two meals that were ever eaten breakfast and dinner um, right now I'm in a on a kick where I'm pretty much eating only two meals a day so I can relate to this um, personally right now in my life but typically you know, as Westerners, we eat three meals a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, or breakfast, lunch, supper, depending on what part of the country you're from. Um, but here they only ate breakfast and dinner. Now, breakfast could either be get served early in the morning. Remember, they're always getting up early. Or it could be served up until midday around noontime. The reason for this being is depending on the work um, or the place where they lived, it may or may not be more beneficial to eat early in the morning have your strength but it may also be better for them to wait till later in the evening um, once they've had an opportunity to do some work and get the day behind them so that the food would fuel them longer throughout the day the main meal was typically the dinner the the evening meal and this was considered their main meal so it probably was a lot more elaborate i imagine breakfast was more simple um you know uh probably not as as big of a spread there wouldn't be as many options but dinner would definitely be the main meal for the family in that house um moving on we are on page 33 there towards the bottom the weaving of cloth and making of clothes now with most of these chores you'll notice that a lot of these were assigned to the women no surprise this was also a, a chore or a job that the women were a part of and they would weave the cloth and make clothes so the women were, were responsible for making the clothing but even more than that they were responsible for the gathering of wool off of their flocks and then they would take a um, an instrument and they would uh, process that wool so that it could be used for weaving uh, Proverbs 31 and 19 states that she layeth her hands to the spindle and her hands hold the distaff. Now I have some photos to share with you and I'm going to do my best to be able to share those on this video. Um, hopefully that works out in editing, but I have some photos to share with you regarding that. But the interesting thing about the Proverbs 31, 19 scripture is an is a way to identify how this Proverbs woman, this woman far above rubies, her value being far above rubies, shows that she was never idle. She was constantly busy. She was kept her hands busy. She wasn't, you know, getting into things that she didn't need to get into as far as gossip, um, drama, church drama, family drama, or whatever. She was making sure that she stayed busy. So uh, the looms that were used, um, which was a tool used to create the fabric. So you would create the wool into fine yarn or like a uh, 
not really a string, but it would be a fine wool. Um, and then they would weave them together on these looms. Um, the needles that were used for these were made out of bronze or bone that had been sharpened. Um, and then there would be a little hole in one end. Now the spinning, um, the spinning of the wool was also a time of fellowship for the women. And um, usually the older women would be the ones that would be responsible for the uh, spinning of the wool. Again, referring to that verse in Proverbs, um, a virtuous woman, she's not idle. And so while she's busy working the, the wool into the yarn that she's able to weave into a fabric to make the clothing, there's going to be time for her to have fellowship. And also a lot of these ladies would take small, like informal meals at this time. So they were, I, I suppose that they would have um, days or particular, you know, times of the year when their specific job was to work that wool um, into yarn and then eventually weave it into fabric and then ultimately turn it into clothes. Speaking of clothes, we've got to wash them at some point. So, um, and I thought this was interesting too. Um, so regarding the washing of clothes, typically what they would do is they would take um, all of their laundry and there would be a local source of fresh water, a stream, um, a lake or a pond, depending on where they were, probably not lake. I think that's more of a, not especially not in that culture, but um, a stream maybe, um, and they would dip their water or dip their clothing into the water, lay it out across a rock, and then they had a long, um, about a foot and a half long wooden paddle that was flat on one side, and they would beat the clothing in order to get out all the dirt, all the sweat, <clears throat> any kind of stains or whatever. It was their way to clean their clothes. Um, now, <clears throat> the Psalmist David has a very interesting um, perspective of this found in uh, Psalms 51 and 2. If you look there on page 34, there towards the middle of the page, he states, wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity. Now, this word here wasn't just like a, a rinsing or like when you're, you know, a, a dipping, like when you're baptized where you're just putting something under or even a, an, um, you know, when they were to wash hands, how the water would be poured over. This was a specific word that was used that was similar to the word used for when the laundry was washed. Now, if you remember, they were taking that clothing, that fabric, and putting it over rocks and beating it. So this psalmist is saying, wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity. In other words, do whatever you have to do in order to get the sin, the things that are not right in me, the th unclean things out of me, even to the point of kneading or beating <clears throat> Don't just rinse it off of me. I want to make sure that you eliminate all of those things that would keep me from being um, who I need to be and where God wants me to be. He was willing to submit to any painful measure in order to be clean or for God to see him as um, pure again. Now, they did have a particular soap that they used. Um, it was a vegetable alkali. Um, a, it was processed in a way that they would take the fat from vegetables. Um, and you also may have heard the term of lye soap. And it would be processed in a way, a very strong soap, a very um, great for cleaning out um, stains, a stain remover. Um, and that was the type of soap that they would use um, for the washing of the clothes. And again, I have some photos to share regarding the washing of the clothes, just for your reference. Hopefully those edit in okay. Um, next section, so the caring for the goats were, was done by the girls, the young ladies, the young women in a family or in a tribal setting. Um, and whereas the, the men would take care of the camels or the larger animals, the girls would take care of the goats. Now, the watering could be challenging for them. 
and that it would be challenging in the sense that the herders or those that were responsible for the camels, they would um, basically fight over space or uh, challenge one another for who was going to water their um, herd or their flock first. You may recall a certain story about a young man named Moses who fled to Jethro's um, establishment, his home, his residence, and he makes friends with the daughters of Jethro, and they are defending their space to water their flocks. And at this time, the shepherds had come in with their camels. They were like, you guys move out of the way. It's our turn. We're going to take our, you know, the opportunity to water our camels or our, you know, our animals get out of the way. But Moses stood up for them, befriended them and said, hey, you let these ladies take care of their animals as well. That um, story is actually found in Exodus 2, 15 through 21. Um, next we're talking about, um, and I'm moving pretty quickly from here through this because we, it's kind of a longer lesson, um, the midday siesta. Now I know that I know that I know that Filipinos are very familiar with a midday nap. Um, it is not uncommon, um, for me to have seen, especially on the several times I've visited, um, workers, especially construction crews and different things, um, working around in the city. The workers will be laid out on a piece of cardboard um, and there's, you know, those that are in transient living, those that are homeless. Um, I've seen them middle of the day, wherever they are, whatever they're doing, everybody takes a nap. Um, and this was a similar custom during this time. It is the hottest time of the day from noon to three o'clock in the afternoon. And so everybody just stops and takes a rest. It's too hot to work. Let's just rest. And so while they're resting, um, the shops may be closed. Um, the laundry areas may be closed. Um, they would just take a time to rest their bodies. Now, I know um, some companies in Japan are actually known for um, scheduling a nap time in some of the offices. And they do this because they feel like their workers will be more productive if they've had an opportunity to rest. So it's not uncommon to go and maybe some of the um, office buildings, people sleeping at their desk because it is scheduled nap time. Um, I know here in the US, the only place that I can think of where there is a scheduled nap time is in the daycare or the childcare facilities that we have here. So the little young kids, they have a certain time of the day where all the teachers or the um, the ones in charge of taking care of the children, they put all the kids down for a nap. So if you're a kid here in the US, you get nap times, but if you're an adult, we don't get nap times here. <laughs> um, so the benefits of being Filipino, right? You get naps. So the daily conversation. So what are they talking about in their in their day-to-day -day life? Well, um, Typically, one of the biggest things is obviously the name of God. They're talking about God all day long. Um, <clears throat> the God's name is constantly on the lips of these people. An astonished person or a surprised person might say, uh, Mashallah, which is, what has God wrought? In other words, what's going on? Instead of saying that, they would use this term which references the name of God, saying, what has God wrought. Um, Balaam, centuries ago, um, used the very same expression. What has God wrought? Why is this donkey talking to me? This is crazy. Um, if a man is asked if he expects to do a certain thing, he will make the answer if God wills. And um, there are several other examples there that you can see under the daily conversation. Uh, when a farmer greets his worker, he says to him, God be with you, and they will answer him, God bless thee. So it's not uncommon for um, you're seeing a stranger, maybe you're doing um, transacting some kind of business, and they speak the name of God to anyone and to everyone. It is a very, very common thing in that culture. Whereas sometimes I think, um, especially Western culture, I'm not so sure uh, too much about Filipino culture, but I know in the West, 
we don't not mention God, but it's we're kind of hesitant because the, a lot of Western people can be offended by that. You know, what whether they are not Christian, there's we have a lot of Muslim community that lives here. Um, so you don't want to be offensive because you can't win souls if you're offending them. Um, and then we have, you know, agnostics and atheists and different things like that. And so it's we're kind of reserved in our mention of God, making sure, are you okay for us to be talking about this? Because I will, I'm happy to share if you're willing to listen, but we don't just naturally assume that anybody we meet here in the U.S. would be willing to um, talk about God. Um, so that's kind of an interesting thing that it was so common that you could just use, you could just talk about it at any time. Now, this was interesting, and it probably explains a lot of scriptures in the Bible that I always thought were like, wow, why did they choose to use um, these words or this analogy or this expression? Like, it just seems so over the top. Well, apparently, um, figurative language and exaggerated expressions were very common. For instance, um, when Paul is telling... Um, or Luke is giving um, his account of Paul's experiences. There came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. And when he was come unto us, he took Paul's girdle, or like his belt, bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle. Well, that wasn't literally going to happen it was a figure of speech or another way to say that hey they're gonna they're gonna bind you up they're gonna t have an opportunity to get you um, in a place where you can't just do whatever you want to do and if john the baptist had spoken this one was really funny to me um to some of the if he had used the expression in the west the expression um he would have said instead of there in the um, indented paragraph. O oh, generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth, therefore, fruits, meet for repentance, and think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Now that's what he says, but if he were here in the West, he may have saying, you pretensions to virtue and good birth far exceed your actual practice of virtue. In other words, you say all of these things that you're intending to do, but we know better that you're not genuinely going to do those things. In other words, so Paul is giving um, this great big lengthy speech when he could have said it in a much shorter phrase. Again, exaggerated expression. Um <clears throat> Another example is um, um, one man might say to one another, what I say to you is truth. If it's not, I will cut off my right arm. Well, nobody really expects him to cut off his right arm, but it was a way to signify, I am really serious. I am telling you the absolute truth. I am not messing around. I'm not playing. This is serious. This is actually what I think. This is actually happened. This is the true statement. Um, <clears throat> now, because of this, they can fully appreciate when Jesus said, if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. If thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. So Jesus isn't necessarily saying, you know, if you look at something, you need to poke your eye out, but he's saying you need to be so careful and cautious that you are willing to go to whatever degree not to put the things in front of you that would be a stumbling block or a hindrance or cause you to sin or be tempted. Um, the same thing with your hands. If you're doing something that is not pleasing to God, you need to be so serious about doing the will of God that you're willing to go to that extreme measure to not be doing those things. <clears throat> Another example, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Well, we know that a camel can't go through the eye of a needle. 
that's totally impossible. But the way they expressed it, the exaggerated expression was, look, it is easier for this massive animal to fit through this tiny little space than it is for a rich man to go to heaven. Um, now, I hope that's not true of all rich men. I hope that they're all willing to be um, taught the truth and eventually be with us in heaven. But the the fact remains that they're saying it's so, so difficult because, you know, rich men are <clears throat> consumed with their money, their things, the acquisition of those things. <clears throat> so the exaggerated expression here is that, hey, it's easier for this to happen than a rich man to go to heaven. Um, one other thing is um, the um, delicate subjects. So if you're in mixed company here in the U.S., we don't talk about, um, for the most part, we don't talk about things like giving birth, um, especially um, in a mixed company, especially if there are different generations involved. Um, it's not something typically preached about. You may you won't necessarily hear some example or some drawn out story given over a pulpit. Those are typically the types of conversations that are held within, like ladies would only talk about that privately amongst themselves. Um, I don't know what, maybe other medical conditions or something, you know, you would only talk about those, not in mixed company, men and women together, but you would talk about those privately. But in this case, <clears throat> it was not uncommon for them to talk about these types of things as long as it was something that was a natural experience. Um, for instance, that I just gave the example, like giving birth. That would not be embarrassing or awkward or uncomfortable for them to talk about. It was just natural. Um, <clears throat> moving on. How are we doing on time? Excellent. Okay, the going to the um, the women getting the water. Now, again, this was one of those tasks that was reserved specifically for the women. Only the women were the ones drawing the well, and they would typically go in the evening time, um, late afternoon or evening. Um, and sometimes early in the morning, I guess it depends on the, uh, the day, what that day brought, if um, additional water would be needed for that day um, they had earthenware pitchers um, which i believe we talked about several several chapters ago and the women would carry them either on their shoulder or on their hip um, it's also not uncommon to have seen them carrying the pitchers on their head now it was so um, put into this culture that the women would do this that the men like never ever did this like seldom ever ever did this and we can see that um in as, as in an example when jesus instructed two of his disciples he said go ye into the city and there you shall meet a man bearing a pitcher of water follow him that's found in mark 14 13. now this was a way that they could no doubt identify the person they were looking for because it would be such an an obscure such a crazy wild thing oh there's the only one man that's carrying the water pitcher we know that's the one we're looking for because like i said it was considered only a woman's task um, now if there was a large load or um, a great deal amount of water that was required then um, it's possible that the men would be responsible for carrying that because of the weight but again this is going to be a much um, bigger thing. It's not going to be a small jar or a pitcher, um, but it would be, um, I believe they refer to it as a um, <clears throat> skins of sheep or goat for carrying that supply. Um, so at the wells um, where, the, where they would draw the water, there were no um, instruments. There were no tools that were just left there. What would happen is each woman would bring with her um, a portable bucket with a rope that she would lower down into the water and draw the water um, that she required. Um, now, the interesting thing here, um, when the Samaritan woman um, meets Jesus at the well um, and he asks her to drink, she's like, um, you know, hey, you have no bucket and the well is deep. And so Jesus asks her, you know, to help draw the water. 
the interesting thing is that the Samaritan woman came to the well prepared to do her job. She was equipped. She was ready. But she was re she was equipped to do the very thing that the Lord would require of her. So we have to remember that the Lord will never ask of us something that we are not capable of doing. If he has asked you to do something, you can do it. You are already equipped. He is not going to ask you to do a task that you don't have the tools, you don't have the resources, or you don't have the opportunity. If God has asked you to do it, be encouraged. You're already equipped to do that thing. And God is well able to give you the strength that you need to have faith in your own abilities and his desire to use you just as you are. All right, so that's it. That was a lot of information. Um, if you want, I would highly recommend you going back over these notes and making um, highlights for some of the important parts um, or the things that stuck out to you most. Um, interesting subject here, and I will be trying to add the photos if I'm unable to add them to this video, what I will do is I will add them to our group chat on Facebook. And with that said, you guys have a fantastic evening. I will see you all next week. Um, hopefully, I will be able to go to live with you at some point, although it is very early for me. But I do enjoy seeing your faces. God bless you all. Take care and have a great evening.